Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Laura Vaselli, the Manager of Research and Foresight at eCampus Ontario, and I will be the moder moderator for today's session. Uh, I am joining today from a very snowy Toronto, which is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabek Nations, and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. I am a guest and a settler on this land. And I pair my land acknowledgement today with action, action that we can take towards reconciliation and decolonization. So today I ask that we create a space built on curiosity and respect. To that end, I invite attendees of this session to actively engage with our presenters by using the chat to submit questions or comments, uh, which we will discuss at the end. But today, our, pre our presenters are Sam Gray, Educational Consultant, and Stevie Jonathan, University Unit Manager, both from Six Nations Polytechnic, both of whom were project leads during the creation of three of the micro-credentials Six Nations Polytechnic produced through the first round of the virtual learning strategy. They will discuss first defining and then meeting the challenges of creating short duration Indigenous e-learning content rooted in local histories, experiences, and understandings. They will take us through a discussion of how their instructional designers, subject matter experts, community-based researchers, and local educators came together to forge new pathways in Indigenous e-learning. Sam, please go ahead. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Laura, and uh, welcome to everyone joining us today. Um, as Laura said, my name is Sam. I'm here with my uh, incredible colleague, Stevie Jonathan, uh, and we will start today by presenting a short overview of our three virtual learning strategy micro credentials projects, and then move into the two areas we wanted to focus on, which lie at the core of the unique development process undertaken by Six Nations Polytechnic and the Indigenous Institutes Consortium. If we could go to the next slide. So our approach today is a kind of a case study based on three of the four micro-credentials we built over the course of the VLS. Those include Indigenous teaching and learning, Indigenous e-learning assessment strategies, and Hyflex design in Indigenous teaching and learning. Two of these, as you can see at the bottom, were collaborative projects led by SMP, in which all seven Indigenous institutes were partners. The third was a standalone initiative here at Six Nations Polytechnic. Next slide, please. These three micro-credentials constitute a teaching and learning suite. They interweave content to cover uh, a, a very significant swath of the foundations of Indigenous e-learning. They also work together to provide a host of other benefits to a number of constituencies and stakeholders, both inside and beyond the Indigenous institutes, as well as embedding and upholding Indigenous knowledge, histories, perspectives, and approaches. Next slide. Our development process was based on extensive primary research, both because that approach manifests a decolonizing methodology in and of itself, co-creating knowledge in a relational way, uh, and also because the kind of published data available for many of the, if not most of the mainstream instructional, instructional developers out there was literally not available to us. We undertook a month long research phase that was multimodal and iterative where we convened knowledge co-creation conversations and workshops with Indigenous educators. We performed the expected literature reviews and environmental scans. We ran an open online survey in which every member of the teaching and learning community could participate. Uh, we queried their lived experiences and we solicited their personal insights. And we ran full pilots of all of our micro-credentials courses, including gathering that essential learner feedback and then we convened a special project quality assurance committee to review the finished courses. So this really was a deeply collaborative, um, fundamentally participatory undertaking. Next slide, please. When we set out to do the work, we grounded our planning in some core considerations arising from our collective desire to do this in a good way, coming from the institutional values of Six Nations Polytechnic. We were absolutely committed to centering all of our work, meaning both the products and the processes in Indigenous epistemologies and pedagogies. And moreover, doing this by drawing on those lived experiences of the members of our teaching and learning communities. We were committed to making sure that the curriculum and the methodology were learner-centric. We were committed to treating these initiatives as not one-off projects, but sustainable resources that serve our instructors and our students 
that go beyond just addressing their needs to supporting their strengths and their goals. And then these last two points, uh, which are our focus for the remainder of this presentation, we were committed to finding the balance between open access and information governance and to developing rigorous and appropriate quality assurance mechanisms. Next slide, please. Next slide. Uh, the eCampus Ontario virtual learning strategy was uh, built around the idea of developing the resource, resource commons for post-secondary education through round one funding projects. But open data is not a straightforward matter for Indigenous peoples, and accordingly, it's not a straightforward matter for Indigenous institutes. Open access regimes are quite resonant with uh, principles of relationality and sharing across strengths but it is impossible to ignore the colonial history of enclosure in both physical and intangible resource realms. Similarly, open educational resources can be a very powerful tool in support of educational sovereignty for indigenous communities and nations, but not without an underlying understanding of indigenous people's rights in this area. Next slide, please. So Indigenous data sovereignty is the right of Indigenous peoples to govern the collection, ownership, and application of data, including digital materials, knowledge, and information about Indigenous communities, peoples, lands, and resources. Underscoring Indigenous data sovereignty is a growing suite of tools and approaches that seek to realize that right. These include, for example, the First Nations principles of ownership, control, access, and possession, and the Local Context Project on Traditional Knowledge Labels. Um, the VLS project through eCampus Ontario uh, used the latter in addition to their established uh, open access protocols. So these are important foundations, but they are components, not complete systems. OCAP, for example, leaves the issue of specific prote protections open to development by the individual group, community, or nation, as it should be, while TK labels are just that, they're labels. They're applied to outputs, and they do not have the status of licenses in the mainstream. So when it came to developing our virtual learning strategy materials, we had a lot to consider. How to balance open access with adequate protections was the most obvious, but even this was not a straightforward issue because it focused on only one facet of what it means to engage in Indigenous knowledge-based educational resource development work. Next slide. So we were basically obliged to look at this as an issue of end phase licensing, when in reality, it is just not that limited. Our development work embraces not just product, but processes, and additionally has layers of nuance depending on what kind of knowledge we're talking about. Is it Indigenous knowledge writ large? Is it an application of Indigenous knowledge? Is it held by the community, or is it part of an individual's or institution's set of experiences and understandings? How is the process being authorized? How are the outputs being validated? All of these ideas and procedures fall under the rubric of information governance and data sovereignty, but the mechanisms that would constitute a holistic, contextualized, and robust process are still under development. So doing this kind of work in a good way means having the freedom to perform these prior tasks and this prior build first. How do we support Indigenous institutes in creating the required ecosystem of rights and responsibilities around data so that they can continue to contribute in ethical and just ways to that broader knowledge and resource commons in post-secondary education? Next slide, please. That starts with recognizing principles and then putting principles into action. So in principle, it's critical to question foundational assumptions. For example, copyright and copyleft are assumed to provide adequate and appropriate protection for all forms of expression, but they both share one epistemological root, and Indigenous epistemologies are not represented in that binary. In figuring out how to question this particular assumption in a productive way, it's helpful to look at the Indigenous Institutes Act, which is legislation that flowed directly from Indigenous Institutes advocacy and activism. Instead of perpetuating the assumption that Indigenous institutes can or should be indigenized colleges or universities, the Act establishes a third pillar of post-secondary education and skills training in Ontario. This same approach could be taken for copyright and distribution licensing regimes in the province, just like eCampus Ontario developed uh, an Ontario Commons license, the third pillar, the Indigenous Institutes and the Indigenous Institutes Consortium, 
may want to develop a license unique to the ontological and operational context that they are in, in the spirit of equality and distinction embodied in the Indigenous Institutes Act, neither copyright nor copyleft. In principle, it's vital that mainstream actors help shoulder the responsibility of raising awareness. The Indigenous Institutes operate under a kind of double burden of doing the work and explaining work. But it's possible to take on some of that responsibility by proactively committing to building a deeper and broader understanding. So for example, there are many materials that the Indigenous Institutes have individually and collectively put out into the world that provide a baseline understanding of their history, their jurisdiction, their operating environment, their teaching and learning communities, and their aspirations. If you go to the IIC's webpage, you'll find a report on virtual learning and micro-credentialing in the Indigenous Institute sector that discusses and strategizes open access challenges. But uh, of course, this isn't meant to replace dialogue. That will always be the most important principle, but it is a strong precondition for meaningful collaboration across the three pillars. Again, in principle, it's important that we move beyond recognition to ensuring that Indigenous knowledge and its sources and stewards are fully present at foundational levels. This means equal particip participation at visioning and decision-making tables so that stakeholders are also authors of the processes that govern them. It also means developing a system that doesn't really acknowledge but actively promotes diversity. So for example, it might be necessary that a copyright and licensing regime that affirms all three of Ontario's post-secondary pillars includes revoc revocable consent, includes mediated access instead of in perpetuity consents and fully open access. And finally, in principle, it's essential to support Indigenous Institute's development of appropriate policies and processes for information governance and data sovereignty. So Indigenous Institutes and the Indigenous Institutes Consortium need the resources, including materials, supports, and extended timelines to undertake the work of determining just what an Indigenous rights-based knowledge and educational resource sharing environment looks like. And with that, I am going to pass the mic over to Susie. I am Stevie Jonathan. I'm the unit manager of the University Department at Six Nations Polytechnic. I am Mohawk Nation, will plan from Six Nations of the Grand River. Today, I'm going to be discussing the Indigenous Institutional Quality Assurance Frameworks that is very much needed in the micro credential environment. Um, from our perspective. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Six Nations Polytechnic is uniquely mandated to meet the quality assurance standards and benchmarks of mainstream institutes in addition to the standards and benchmarks necessary of an Indigenous institute. Following a two-road epistemology, this IQAF, or Institutional Quality Assurance Framework, is unique to S&P as it brings together both systems of education while being firmly grounded in S&P's identity as a Haudenosaunee organization. This means that values and principles evident in the creation story and the great law, including those of the good mind, kinship and mutual aid are also evident in the practices of the organization. The creation of this framework is a resultant of a self-study process and environmental scan of several existing quality assurance standards and benchmarks not to mention the framework for programs of instruction, the Indigenous Advanced Education Skills Council Organization Review and Program Review Handbooks, the World Indigenous Nations Higher Education Consortium, or WINHEC Accreditation Handbook, the Ontario College of Trades of Training Standards, the Ontario Qualifications Framework, to name a few. Quality assurance frameworks guide the life cycle of academic programming for development, delivery, review, and revision of programming. The purpose of these frameworks is to achieve Indigenous education excellence, respond, respond to our dual mandate in, in an intentional way, and further solidify our learner-centered approach to education and institutional effectiveness grounded in Haudenosaunee thought and philosophy. Next slide, please. <clears throat> In order to achieve Indigenous education excellence, we must ground ourselves in the principles of the good mind, kinship, and mutual aid. 
this quality assurance framework builds on these principles where kinship is the system of relationships, mutual aid is the, the support for one another, it's the enactment of interconnectedness as evidence in the or the words before all else, where the natural world models how we must support one another and offer aid. The good mind is a way of thinking and living according to Ongoho and loosely translated to the native way with peace, love, positive intent, and strength. These values sustain Ongohoi ways of knowing and being for time immemorial and are transmitted through oral traditions like the creation story and the great law. When these principles are enacted through protocols, we're able to achieve institutional effectiveness, stability, and sustainability, naturally resulting in indigenous education excellence, which includes alignment with who we are as Ongohoi and the revitalization and maintenance of our knowledges and languages. And it's because of this mandate, we also have the responsibility of protecting indigenous knowledge. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Every credential granting institute is responsible for ensuring the quality of its programs of study, including modes of delivering programs and services that affect the quality of the program, Protocols are intertwined with accountability to governing bodies, which for s and includes internal accountability shown here, and also external to our community, our learners, and the language and knowledge we carry. Protocols are the more specific and detailed practices that flow from the principles articulated earlier. Protocols we have developed include audit protocol, program cyclic reviews, expedited approvals, and major modifications in new programs, New to this Indigenous quality assurance framework that captures all of these protocols is the protocols for curriculum development and opportunities for revision, which had really become solidified for us in micro-credential projects because we needed to examine ways in which we do things, particularly as it relates to knowledge dissemination on a larger scale, and even more so when we're even slightly including Indigenous knowledge. Next slide, please. With the key considerations around IK protection or Indigenous knowledge protection in mind, we developed these three quality assurance measures, which were solidifying as an overarching protocol in the institutional quality assurance framework. The first measure within this protocol is listening to community. We've done this through our primary research. The second was involving community through course pilots and learner evaluations and feedback. And finally, asking community, asking them, is what we're doing okay? Does this fit with us, with our identity as Haudenosaunee or Ongohoi? And we accomplish this through a, a review committee. Next slide, please. Joanne's Archibald's book titled Indigenous Story Work, Educating the Heart, Mind, and Body and Spirit deals with the challenges of respectfully including Indigenous knowledge within the academic and educational setting. These challenges were on our mind from the very moment we started discussing the micro-credentials and open education resource that we were going to be developing. The key challenges included adapting IK to fit into a Western worldview and pedagogical framework just doesn't work. Indigenous knowledge can be appropriated by those who don't fully understand it. It is often about not about point A to B to C, but are complex and interwoven. IK is to be understood as a whole, not understood as parts. And what is understood by one is not an understood by all. Additionally, I found through my experiences, being a subject matter expert, a researcher, and an instructor through pilots and outside of these micro-credentials, is that the lifelong learning process of acquiring Indigenous knowledge is at odds in a micro-credential environment that is centered on being fast-paced. However, there are still ways in which to achieve learner understanding and being able to give the experience of Indigenous pedagogy to the learners. You can do things the same differently. Secondly, expertise doesn't equate to cultural authority. In other words, we need to explicitly teach the ethics around protecting Indigenous knowledge, including ownership and permission of dissemination of Indigenous knowledges, so as not to leave learners to believe that because they've taken the micro credential on creation stories as an example, that they have the cultural authority to teach that. The goal is to bring learners to the understanding of ethics and respect that enables them to act as these concepts on these concepts by engaging with community 
and by bringing in guest speakers or a co-teacher who belong to the nation of which they wish to discuss so that IK is protected and the experience for the learner is authentic. To summarize, ethics of IK need to be explicitly taught, which creates opportunities for long-lasting allyship and reconciliation. Next slide, please. And Tutso, uh, Namato, that's all I have to discuss today. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. Just getting my video back. There we are. Thank you so much, Stevie and Sam. I, I think. Um, I'm really glad we're, we're ending on this session today. Certainly a lot for every attendee to think about. And um, Sam, you're, the line that you, you mentioned in your presentation that Indigenous Institutes not only have to do the work, but then explain the work. Um, just our deepest gratitude for, for coming here today and, and taking us through this process. And it is also not lost on me that you know this week is also Open Education Week. And I think you know the points that both of you made just will flow throughout all of all that we do in the future going forward. Um, I once again want to open the floor to any questions and, and while we wait for those to come in, um, I do have a few and um, I'm hoping that we can, through my questions, we can uh, root your responses given the case study that you provided us today. So I also will mention to all attendees, I did put some links in the chat there of a few of the publications Sam was referring to. Uh, we can put SMP's website in there as well for further learning. Um, but my first question is about alternative and authentic assessments. If you refer to the, the description of today's session, uh, Sam and Stevie talk about how um, the micro-credentials they produce as part of the virtual learning strategy. They wanted to create um, assessments that support learner flourishing and intellectual self-determination. So I was hoping that you could speak a little bit more to that um, and, and maybe how that came through, especially keeping in mind the quality assurance process that you mentioned. Yeah, I can definitely speak to that. I was the pilot instructor and the developer for the um, Indigenous e-learning assessment strategies course. And what had really become apparent is that learners really benefit from the co-creation of knowledge with their peers. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about intellectual self-determination, it's really bringing the learner to be their, their own agent of change within their lives and in their learning process. And that's really important to that learning process is to be able to get engaged and create with relationships with one another, but then also internalize that process to have that intellectual self-determination. Right, right. And then it makes me think of the point, Stevie, you mentioned just there at the end of your presentation about how um, micro-credentials being so fast-paced might actually work against learners' uh, commitment to lifelong learning. Um, so how did you wrestle with that? I'm curious, especially as an instructor too. Yeah, that was definitely something that was on our minds throughout the development process and also going through the, the pilot course. One thing that we were able to do and which was appreciated by our learners is being able to have that hybrid model. So giving the learner the choice to learn the lecture content on their own, but still maintaining the quality and relationship of that co-creation of knowledge by having the in-person delivery as an option as well. So that they're able to get that experience. Wonderful, wonderful. I see we do have a question pop up in the Q and A. Um, it's from Robert. If I'll, I'll just read it out if that's okay. Uh, it says, "Thank you very much for putting forward such thoughtful insights on issues regarding open educational resources, licensing issues, and Indigenous knowledge. Knowledge. These are important issues that we have been dedicating much work to. This relates well to the Indigenous learner experience design noted in the IIC report." What are some of the ways you suggest we support this effort and Indigenous Institutes? Sam, did you want to speak to that question? Yeah, I guess I just have a, a, a clarification that I need on, are we talking about Indigenous learner experience design uh, being supported? I just want to clarify. We will give Robert a chance to clarify in the chat. Therefore, you should this question. I think that is what he is referring to. Yeah, I just reread his his question. Yes, he says both in the chat. Thanks, Robert. Thanks, Robert. 
I think I, uh, I, in the session that we had with the Indigenous Institute Consortium yesterday, I gave um, a little bit of a, well, kind of a, a, a very warm and, and sincere shout out to eCampus Ontario for the kind of opportunity that came through the VLS, which did give us some of the things I, re I referenced as, as essential, which are um, the, the actual tangible material supports, but also the time and the, the, the space in, in the discursive and, and visioning and strategizing realm to articulate what the Indigenous Institutes need to do this work well. So we had a lot of ongoing conversations with eCampus Ontario about um, some of our challenges and some of our concerns and the ways that we could work together to do the development piece um, in a way that didn't just end for that final product and a, a space on the, the repository shelf, but that gave us the opportunity to engage and develop processes like the ones that Stevie was referencing, things that we had to put in place to assure that, um, that this was happening the right way and was moving in the right direction and was involving um, the, all of the people that needed to be involved. So um, potentially more partnerships like this. I would also like to point to the guidelines that the IIC has published on partnering with Indigenous Institutes as a fantastic resource. Um, and uh, I would also like to uh, invite Stevie as, um, as someone who is involved in the development of all three of these micro credentials to, to also speak to what it means to support this work. Yeah, absolutely. I think Sam covered a lot of it. I think what stood out for me in terms of being able to have that support, like Sam was saying, the opportunity to have the time to develop curriculum in this way was really eye-opening for us in terms of the different protocols that we needed and kind of filling those gaps <clears throat> within our own practices um, and being able to have the time and the staff personnel to do it. So I would say supporting and partnering in terms of developing the micro-credential environment for Indigenous institutes is very much needed. Understanding the standards and regulations that go around student records around micro-credentials is really important for our student mobility. And also that advocate, continued advocacy for Indigenous institutes that we are the third pillar of education. We are able to offer certificates, diplomas, degrees across the OQF, similarly to colleges and universities. So that's what that means is the third pillar, right? So making that, um, making that known within the post-secondary education sector is one way that you can be an ally and an advocate within um, for Indigenous institutes. And I will point out too, for all attendees, I will put the link to that partnership document Sam mentioned, the Indigenous Institutes Act, we can put those in the chat. Um, but, and I thank you both too. We are certainly open and wanting to um, adapt our processes as we can. But again, it's the additional work that your team is providing to us by advocating and sharing and creating that space. Um, lots of great comments in the chat, lots of thank yous. Um, another question that I wanted to ask um, uh, came to me, especially when Stevie was talking about that quality assurance process. Um, you know, when we talk about micro credentials, we talk about industry rec uh, recognition, employers validation. Um, but how, I was curious how you approach that in this context, especially given all the work that you do with community and, and maybe um, the prioritization of that employer uh, recognition piece. Yeah, that's a really great question. That's something that we grappled with a lot as well. Micro credentials were very much pitched to the sector as a way for employability skills and things like that. And for me, language revitalization is such a passion. So that was one of the questions that I had to ask myself is how do I develop a micro credential that is going to be appealing to many other people in order to um, have those employability skills and be labor market driven. Um, so I think that's a question that we're still answering. Mm. Um, you know, kind of, do we want to do things that is going to be beneficial for labor market or do we want to do things that is going to be beneficial for indigenous peoples, their knowledges and their languages, particularly around language revitalization. And I think for me, it's okay to not have those things align. Micro credentials are a way in which we can offer language to many other people um, without having to go through program reviews and accreditation, which is lengthy, because right now we need language revitalization happening because Haudenosaunee languages are so endangered. Um, so that's on the top of my mind. 
this year is the launch of the International Decade of Indigenous Languages, which means that over the next 10 years, um, Six Nations, particularly Six Nations Polytechnic, is really looking at a language revitalization strategy. And micro-credentials is gonna be one of the ways in which we support um, that language revitalization strategy for us. Totally. I think, and I'm so glad to hear that I'm, I'm excited to see the development that your team goes through as you, you know, understand these questions. I mean, I'm even inclined to think the way we approach industry recognition, that validation that's rooted in such colonial frameworks, colonial frames of mind, and how can we, you know, produce micro-credentials that is, uh, really assist and works towards that cultural reassurance. Uh, I've been given the go ahead to keep you on a Q&A for another minute, if I can ask one more question I had. Um, in, in the report uh, that Sam mentioned and I put in the chat, um, there's a great uh, section in one of the recommendations talking about how um, micro-credentials, although they have existed for many years, how the, the current approach to them is really rooted in technology and being on the go when you need it, short duration. And I think one thing the report speaks to is the way that uh, approach um, wrestles with um, land-based learning. And you mentioned that your micro-credentials were hybrid. And I was wondering if you could speak a little to that and, and maybe how future developments of micro-credentials will take into account that them being fully tech-based uh, might not work for every learner or every um, curriculum. Yeah, definitely. Um, being an Indigenous institute um, within Six Nations particularly, we know the challenges of internet connectivity being an issue. So dealing with the tech um, portions was really something we had to think about. And I think for us, what worked was the hybrid delivery because I had pre-recorded lectures. So mm -hmm. someone could go to a Starbucks, for an example, download the content that they needed and bring it home with them. Um, so there were ways in which we had to get kind of creative with making sure content was accessible and not just live streamed. And this is your one and only chance to learn content. Right. So I think that's something to consider is having the asynchronous and synchronous. Um, and in terms of access to technology, we really had to be flexible and be very learner centered in understanding that everyone has different levels of ability with tech or access to tech. Um, yeah, so it was it was an interesting time, but I think we did a successful job. And I like that approach too, because a lot of our learners, they're working learners, right? They wanna be able to work. That's why they're interested in micro-credentials because they have that flexibility of being asynchronous and synchronous. So I think that's something that we're going to continue to do because it works for the learners. Right, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, we will end the Q&A there. Again, lots of comments and lots of gratitude and thanks um, for this presentation. And I wanna thank you both uh, for all the work that you're doing at SNP um, to, to share things with us that we may not previously have known, of course, and, and to re represent the third pillar um, of the sector. Um, but without further ado, I will now pass it over to Emma, uh, who will close us out for the day. Thank you, everyone. Great, thank you, Laura, and thank you, Stevie and Sam. Uh, so as we close out the forum, it doesn't escape me that today marks two years since the WHO declared COVID-19 as a pandemic. And as we look with hope towards post-pandemic recovery, there's a lot of talk about how we're going to get back to work and about how to support displaced workers. And micro-credentials are often touted as a means to address this issue. Central to this question of how to support is how can micro-credentials increase access to opportunities for learners, whether it's to more learning or to a job. We heard many examples of how to increase access to opportunities throughout these past two days. And I hope that you are leaving this conference newly inspired and better equipped to explore these questions and to create micro-credentials that will create pathways for learners. In a moment, I will welcome back Rowan Smith to close out our event with a land affirmation. But first, just a few notes. Earlier this morning, you received a link to a feedback survey in your inboxes, and we'll share that link again here in the chat. Please, please, please take a few moments to fill this out uh, and help eCampus Ontario shape our next event. We host these events for you, our community, and so it is so important that we hear from you about what worked and what didn't.
A reminder that recordings to the sessions will be available on eCampus Ontario's YouTube channel within the coming weeks. Uh, you might know that eCampus Ontario has a micro-credential community of practice, which is a group of educators, practitioners, administrators, employers from across Ontario and beyond. Next week on March 16th at 1 p.m., we will be hosting a micro-credential forum after party with our community of practice, where we, where we will continue the conversations that were started here over the past two days. If you're interested in signing up to the community of practice and have not yet done so, we will drop the link in the chat for you. Now I have the honor of welcoming back Rowan Smith for a closing land affirmation. affirmation. Thanks, Emma. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know me from yesterday, I'm Rowan. I am 15 years old. I live on Six Nations. I'm a Mohawk turtle, and I go to school at Steam Academy. Um, I'm just going to close up the, or the um, forum for you guys, and then it, it will, you'll be on your way. Uh, basically, what the closing is, it's just the same thing as the opening, but it's to get everyone's minds, or it's to wish everyone a happy rest of their day and rest of their time away until we meet again, basically. Um, so yeah, if you could just take all your hats off and hoods off, I'm sure most of you are inside anyways. Um, and yeah, I'll just make it quick. ダネエンジュアチョイ。さあ、ワンザデッドノハテノファ。ネコトセニエハ。ネディネエンドエヘン。ゴエゴデジコナノニョ。ネトゲンジョトゴワニゴハ。ダネエンジュアチョイ。